This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. We were... um we were just talking about cooking on a cast iron skillet, and uh, uh, Mississippi was talking about how the power went off. What back in '97? You said. I don't know. Is anybody there? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wait, yeah, we were it was, just. It was in '94. '94. Yeah, and uh, power goes off for a couple of weeks, so uh, Mississippi. Uh, 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 was cooking on a cast iron skillet over over a fire apparently, and uh, uh, so the rest of us kind of piping in on this whole thing. It, it um, you know, I talked to my uncle here the other day, and my 91 year old uncle who at 87 remodeled his entire kitchen. Uh, he just got a. He, he's he's into cooking uh, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, he's a hell of a cook. But he got this little deal. Uh, it's called Sue's, Sue's Vid or something to that effect. Uh, cooking and it's done. Uh, it's done in water. You cook your you cook your meals in water, like you cook your steak in water. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sous vide. Yeah, and uh, so he, he got this thing, uh, and I'm sure you've all heard the, uh, I've got one here at the house called the, the Alexa thing from Amazon. Uh, you talk to it, and it, I mean, it'll it'll turn lights on for you. If you got the, 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 the little deals for your light bulbs, it'll play music. You ask it what time it is or what the weather is. Well, apparently, uh, this thing that my uncle got to, to cook with water, it, it it's also controlled by Alexa. You tell Alexa to turn it on to a certain temperature and when and all that. But um, I mean, you 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 cook your meals. I mean, you you do a steak, okay? You just you put your food in a uh, in a in a in a vacuum seal bag or a uh, uh, just you know one of these Ziploc freezer bags. And you put it in this hot circulating water. You set the water temperature to uh, like 149 degrees for chicken or anything, well, whatever. Okay, whatever the temperature that uh, that that you know that stuff is supposed to cook at. And then after a period of time, uh, you know, the alarm goes off and and your 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 meat is done and your steak. So you can eat it then if you want. Uh, if uh, if not, uh, I mean, it doesn't look all that appealing because it still looks kind of raw, but it's cooked. So you take it out, you throw it on the grill, you put your grill marks, brown it up a little bit, and serve it. And it's like you know, it's it's a done deal. So uh, Jeff, you, you've you've heard of this sous vide thing? Uh, way yeah, um, it, it's it's really interesting looking because, like you said, you're you're cooking in water. And rather than using a really high temperature, like you know, say an oven set to thirty three hundred fifty degrees to uh, to to bake or to broil something, uh, you're using water that's essentially set at whatever temperature the meat's supposed to get to, like one hundred and sixty degrees, and you're waiting for the meat to get to that temperature. Um, preserves a lot more of the the flavor, the juiciness, apparently, of the meat, and it's really interesting. But you know, like you said, you have to. You have to do something to brown it or to, to finish it afterwards. Otherwise, it just doesn't look right. It doesn't have the right texture to it. You don't get that caramelized like uh, crust on the outside of it. It's just yeah, part of eating. I'm, a steak. I'm calling. I'm calling a Ron Swanson on this. This is that's not American. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome to the Mead House uh, tonight. Uh, we got a pretty good show lined up for you. Uh, Ryan is going to talk to us about doing some session style meads uh here in a little bit uh jeff uh is our resident uh mead judge uh he's going to uh, talk to us about uh competitions uh and what it really means to a home mead maker 
Uh, and then, uh, Aaron, uh, we're going to talk about his bucket list for 2017, what's on his brew list, what he wants to try to do. Uh, and uh, perhaps we can con him out of a couple of potential recipes. Mississippi and I, uh, we started this graph project a while back, and uh, so we're going to get a couple of updates on where we are uh, with that. But in the meantime, hey, you can listen to the show live on TuneIn Radio. Just go to TuneIn.com, download the app. You can take us with you if you'd like. The replays are always available at the Mead House, iTunes, Stitcher, and Podcastpedia. The Facebook deal is real simple. Just type in the Mead House. It'll take you right there. The website, hey, you got it, themeadhouse.com. Um, everybody's here, Ryan Richardson, uh, Aaron Martin in the house, Mississippi, Chris Spencer, Jeff Schaus. My name is J.D. Webb. Uh, let's, uh, let's go over to Jeff for the Facebook, uh, update. Uh, what'd you find interesting on Facebook this week, Jeff? Well, I, I only have one this week. Uh, it was, uh, and I'm going to butcher his name. I do apologize. It was a uh, Matt Weedy or Whitey, uh, W E I D E on Mead Makers had this really Whitey. cool setup. Whitey. Okay. He's a, um, he's a Minnesota guy. He's, uh, really? just down the street. No kidding. Uh, he had a really cool setup where he was doing his, his initial batch, you know, in, uh, on top of a stir plate to, to do a, an agitation of the meat continually instead of having to, to degas twice a day. That agitation was just pushing the, uh, the CO2 out of the, the must. I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, I, I thought about doing something like that previously and, um, was, yeah, I just wanted to throw a shout out to him because that was, uh, really interesting to me. That's gotta be a huge stir plate. Oh no, he's just doing a one gallon batch, it looks like, or a smaller batch. Right. Um, it's a, a pretty regular sized stir plate, and then he's built a, uh, kind of a wooden frame around it to get a little extra support around it, so that the stir plate sits in the middle of the fermenter, and the, uh, the, the fermenter, like, edges are in, on the wooded frame. So this thing just, I mean, it, it just constantly spins while this thing's uh, bubbling away then? Yeah, there's a little, it looks like a, uh, um, like an oversized pill. It's just a magnetic bar that's coated in uh, a plastic or something you know, food safe that sits yeah. inside the fermenter. And then the stir plate spins that constantly. Um, and well, you, know, you don't have to spin it constantly. I've, there were a number of people chiming in on this. Um, that uh, a couple of people said, yeah, you know, I turn it on a couple of times a day instead of you know, having to do anything complicated with degassing. And that works pretty good. So there are different ways to approach it once you've got the stir plate in place, but the uh, the no must no fuss degassing really appealed to me there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard of these stir plates, and I, I've contemplated, you know, with this beer making thing because I, you know I go looking at some of these recipes and and some of these beer kits, and then you know a lot of people say, yeah, you got to make a starter up. Uh, you know, you, you know, get a one of these giant, uh, uh, you know, science uh, flasks uh, that you see in a chemical lab somewhere, and you put it on this stir plate thing. I get all that, uh, and I've contemplated on on getting one of those. Maybe that's a discussion that we can throw in later on the time. Uh, you know, I'd, uh, is there a benefit to them or not? But I, I like this idea about. Uh, constantly agitating the the must to keep the the CO2 down. Um, I've sat here and stared at my giant, you know, five gallon or seven gallon fermenters, wondering how can I how can I how can I how can I get this thing stirred up? I just push a button or plug something in, you know, that would do the same thing. Stir this thing up to get the CO2 out instead of having to. You know, I mean, I, I got to shut the pumps off, undo the top, hook up the, 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 the you know, the stir thing to my drill, uh, you know, reach inside, turn this thing on. And, you know, it just sometimes it's just a seems like a pain. Uh, right. And, you know, your, your uh, fermenters are the same as my brew bucket. They have a conical bottom. So this yeah. stir plate approach probably wouldn't work for that either just because it would get stuck in that cone. Right. Uh, but I, I've given some similar thought to putting some kind of like an impeller or something inside the fermenter and uh, just having that switch on electronically. Um, on the small scale, that 
that'd be an interesting thing to try. Um, I'm just not really sure how to how to approach it with. Well, uh, you know, like- you know, here's the deal. You can buy. I mean, you can buy all kinds of electric motors. Uh, sure. I'm thinking, you know, mount, and you can buy chucks, just like on the end of a drill. You can buy the chuck part. If you could find a way to attach that to an electric motor to where you could chuck in your stirrer, or even even if you don't have that part, you know, figure out some way to extend a, a stirring rod, uh, on that electric motor and just simply mount the motor on the lid somewhere. So, uh, yeah, that's something that uh, another DIY project I feel coming my way here. <laughs> so, <laughs> or maybe a submersible pump with a and just make a pump over. Uh, yeah, you know, and I hear, uh, isn't that the way that, you know, like Sergio, I mean, you're, you're doing these like, you know, thousand gallon at a time deals. I mean, they, they've got to have some way of doing it. And I think I remember either him or, or, or somebody, uh, talking about that's how they, how they stir their must is by using these circulating pumps. Yeah. He uh, does, uh, they, they do a splash racking. He's actually got a, a, um, a YouTube video on it. I've seen, um, they, they literally pump just from the very bottom of the tank and it splashes over into the top of the tank. Um, and that, that agitates it enough to get some CO2 out there. I think, you know, they're doing that early enough in the process. That's probably also oxygenating the must. So, um, you know, you're, yeah. you're also stirring and keeping the yeast moving up in the solution. It's probably accomplishing a lot of good things all at once. Yeah. And you wouldn't have, I mean, you know, you're talking what, keeping it going for maybe the first, you know, five to seven days and then, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and shut it off, let it do its thing before you rack, you know, uh, yeah, in- interesting. I I, I, uh, I I can feel a DIY project coming on. <laughs> um, what are we drinking tonight, guys? Uh, let's start off with Jeff. Uh, what's in your cup tonight? Oh, tonight I've got uh, so the big um, microbrewery around here is Boulevard Brewing Company, and I've got their latest uh, Smokestack series brew. The Smokestack is their it's it's not necessarily limited run, but it's a little bit a uh, little bit more involved, a little bit more complicated. It's a bourbon barrel aged quad, um, really really heavy and malty, but it's got a nice bourbon flavor to it too. So, um, what's what's the name of the uh, brewery? Boulevard. I wonder if that's the same one. The bottles in the kitchen. Uh... By God, that sounds familiar. I may have just, I may have drank one of those today. I know their their distribution is getting out there. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. Well, um, I, I just, I'm, I'm kind of tethered in here, so I can't just get up and go to the kitchen. But uh, that sounds familiar. Um, uh, did you like it? Oh, it's fantastic. You, it's yeah, it, it's heavy. It's very high alcohol. Um, so it's like I, nine, I, I nine, nine, nine 9% or something, seven or 9% somewhere in there. 11.8. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think the one I had was quite that high. Uh, interesting. Very good. All right, Aaron, uh, what's in your cup tonight? So tonight I'm drinking a beer here from wicked weed brewing out of Asheville, North Carolina. And this is a, an American sour ale called recurrent. Um, it's described as a red sour ale, ale that is uh, fermented with black currants. Actually, they use over a pound per gallon, I believe, of um, black currants, and then they age it in Cabernet barrels. So oh, this wow. is just a, a fantastic beer. I'm really enjoying it. Goes down easy. It's it's just nice and bright, crisp and, and tart, and mm-hmm. and fruity as well. Um, definitely would recommend this one. What's the name of it again? Uh, Recurrent. Recurrent. By, yeah, Recurrent, and it's by Wicked Weed. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm writing these down. Um, I'll, I'll I'll explain to I'll I'll explain uh, when I when I get to me. But uh, uh, Mississippi, uh, tell me you're not drinking coffee tonight. No, I've got a uh, I've got a Bell Haven. Scottish honey ale. It's 
got heather honey in it and boy is it strong <laughs> it's <laughs> unlike anything i've had it's uh the the honey is just is what's doing it and and it's uh it's a braggot so it's uh um and it's sitting at let me see what we got here 8.4 percent wow um but the honey is just awesome I mean, it's just got so much honey coming through. Uh, got to get my hands on some heather honey. Heather honey, okay. Yeah, uh, I've I've not had that one, but I've had Bell Haven's regular Scottish ale, and oh my, that that stuff is so smooth it should be criminal. It goes <laughs> yeah, this so is just like easily. this has got some uh, a little bit of smoke malt in it, maybe some smoke peat malt or something. Or peat smoked malt, and uh, it's just like velvet, and and it's malty. There's there's no bitterness whatsoever. There's no sour or anything. It's just smooth. <laughs> it's like drinking oh. liquid velvet. Awesome. That sounds good. Uh, Ryan, I am drinking a uh, black pepper mead. Since we are, uh, it's, it's dry, it's still, and it's described as zesty. Um, this is a, I, I'm not getting any black pepper out of it myself. I am getting, um, a lot of honey aroma. I did not, um, it's, a buddy of mine picked this up. About six months ago, so it's it's at least six months old, and I have no idea. There's no you know bottled on date on it, so I don't know when it was bottled. But um, it's got a ton of honey. Uh, I think it's mostly perceived sweetness since um, it, the bottle said it's it's dry. Uh, I don't I didn't drop any you know in a in a or drop my hydrometer in it to figure out exactly where it was, but it's. It's it's very smooth and it's uh it's a nice little drinker. Wow. Sounds be be glad you're not getting black pepper because I tried that once. I used some um telecherry black pepper corns um along with uh some long pepper and several other things and to my personal taste, I found out that the flavor of black pepper and honey they don't go together very well. <laughs> <laughs> so not not for my taste anyway so huh. yeah because black yeah, pepper was... uh you know it's you know even when you're cooking black black pepper is one of those strange little little spices that uh there's a sweetness to it but you know when you're cooking the best time if your recipe calls for pepper the best time to add it is near the end because if you let pepper cook, it's like garlic. It turns real bitter. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether that has anything to do with mead making. Uh, I've never had yeah, a black there was pepper. something. There was something terribly. Uh, it was off. <laughs> it was clashing <laughs> bad. It didn't work out well. Well, I um, I went on the hunt. Uh, a couple of days ago, as uh, Mississippi well knows. Uh, as you guys recall, last week uh, we were talking about some beers in the very beginning, and uh, there was a couple that were mentioned, and I couldn't remember what the hell they were. So, you know, who best to ask but uh, Mississippi? So I text him. Uh, I'm, we're wandering up and down the aisles at Bevmo, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I need to find these beers we were talking about, and I couldn't remember. So I texted Mississippi and asked him, what the hell was that beer that, you know, he was talking about? Well, he said it was a, a wee heavy. Uh, there was two of them. Chris, what was the other one? Wee heavy and, uh, oh, uh, Bel the Belgian uh, quad, Belgian quad. And I managed, uh, now, uh, now, you know, here, here's the deal guys. I'm also drinking a bell Haven. <laughs> this is a, uh, wee heavy. Rich Scottish ale. It has a ninety. I don't know what the ninety means on it. Uh, ninety, 90 shillings. Okay, ninety shillings. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Bellhaven Brewery, uh, rich Scottish ale, seven point four percent alcohol, and this thing. I don't know who 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 else was drinking the uh, Bellhaven. No, uh, I got just, the honey yeah. version of that. This this is oh man, this is good stuff. I mean, this is really really good. Uh, it's very smooth. Almost, uh, it almost reminds me of my uh, first bourbon barrel porter. Uh, it's almost got a uh, almost a bourbony flavor to it. Uh, mild, very mild sweetness right at the tail end. Uh, again, this one, like Chris's, is not bitter at all. Uh, I mean, I could sit here and drink four or five of these uh, in one whack. Uh, but at 7.4%, uh, I think one is all I need. Uh, but this is really good, Chris. So uh, Bellhaven, we have it now. I did manage to find the – well, I didn't find the, the Belgian quad. I found something of a substitute. It's actually made by a Canadian brewery. It was a Belgian uh, triple. Uh, I didn't like it. Uh, it's way too hoppy for me, way over the top. Uh, and it had – you know, I'm all for the sweet savory thing going on in food, but I don't get the the whacked out hoppiness with a sweet finish in a beer. I, I don't get that at all. I don't understand that because it doesn't. I don't think you would get that in a true Belgian quad. Though. They're not that hoppy. Yeah, right. may, well, maybe one, maybe so. The one I had wasn't. I don't know. In in general, they're not. At least from my experience, the. Um, Essentially, the term triple quad refers to the um, the amount of malt and or hops uh, yeah. going into it. So um, there are, there are I'm sure American brewers that are um, really interested in in hoppier beers and adding a triple or a, a quadruple quantity of hops to their beer, uh, which I'm yeah. sure would give you a whole mess of hops. Um, but no, in, in the actual two uh, two style um, Belgians that I've had were not the hoppy. My recollection. Well, I couldn't find. Um, I, you know, I, I only found the one which we believe it was a Trappist. I don't remember. Uh, I think I got a picture of it somewhere. Uh, yeah, the Trappist would probably have been more more closer. You know, it would have been more in in line with what I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, See, I had to jump through hoops and pull all sorts of strings to get. I couldn't find a Belgian quad anywhere, and yeah. uh, so I started uh, emailing some friends and uh, some, you know, people that I had made contact with years ago. And uh, so, after all sorts of shipments and mailings and customs and everything, I finally actually got a a real Belgian quad. It was a uh, West Levering, I believe, was the name. And uh, oh my God, it was it was something else. I mean, this stuff is aged like wine almost. Oh, yeah. This this one that I had, in fact, I, I couldn't even finish it. It it was the hops. I mean, it was way over the top, and uh, mm -hmm. it had it had this sweet finish to it that just didn't. It didn't hook up with with the amount of hoppiness that was in this beer, and like I said, I, I, I get the I get the sweet savory thing in food. I don't know if that compares to to sweet and and hoppiness in a beer, but it, it doesn't go together for me. I will tell you. But on that wee heavy, can you can you see where I kind of chose that as a, a base oh, yeah. for a good braggot? Oh I mean, God, yes. Yeah. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, and this, I mean, I I, you know, oh, yeah, I mean, if, if we could come up with a recipe for this beer, uh, for a, wee, a good wee heavy beer that tastes as good, I, I would even consider adding a couple uh, a couple shots of bourbon in it uh, uh, to crank it up a little bit. Uh, this is really, really good. I like this. Uh, but I could see, I could see a nice wildflower honey, uh, something that, you know, a honey that's got some body to it. Uh, I, I wouldn't do anything light like an orange blossom. I, I would put something a little heavier in it, 
but yeah, I, this would be an amazing bragging for sure. What's yeah. funny? Maybe some of this Heather, honey. I don't know who Heather is, but she's got somebody. I can tell you that. Um, let's, uh, let's throw it over to Ryan. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk about some session style meetings. Ryan's mentioned this before, uh, a a few times. And, uh, what, what's, what is it about session meets Ryan that, uh, make them, you know, so enjoyable? Well, I think it's the same way you'd say, you know, what makes a, a beer enjoyable or, or a hard cider or, or anything that's a little bit lower alcohol. Um, you know, it's, it's, you can, you can make them full flavored. You can make them any style you want. Um, and you can do it in a way that, uh, allows you to to have a little a little lower alcohol beverage um you know i i i use the analogy um also that you know a lot of american um american wines are around that um you know 12 13 14% abv when a lot of very very traditional french wines are are under 10 you know, they're, they're eight, nine percent, you know, alcohol by volume. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you, if you tasted them, you'd have really no idea. Um, and it's, it's probably why the French, you know, traditional French lunch includes wine. Um, you know, you can have your, have your drink and, uh, go back to, Still go operate, back to work, operate your heavy machinery. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so for me, it's, it's a style that I like, um, uh, you know, I like having a, a pint or, or, or so, or a 12 ounce glass, whatever it might be, um, enjoying it. And, uh, they're also done the, I think they, you could debate with me on this. Cause I know that there are some, there are a lot of, a lot of methods to speed up your mead making, but you can get them done in a hurry. Um, and you know you're they're they're pretty not i don't know if anyone's on a budget out there but they're pretty they're a lot cheaper to make um I, i'd say a standard for me is uh one pound of honey per gallon you know which you know a lot of the other things we've talked about are are maybe three pounds a gallon maybe triple that amount of honey or so um so i i think what's nice you can make them fairly um quick you can make them cheap you can make them full flavored um and and i think for a lot of people they can be a lot more approachable um uh, if than having a a big uh bold heavy um you know high alcohol uh traditional or just maybe more traditional style not maybe not traditional mead and in, in that it's only you know honey and water but but traditional style and in, in maybe that uh fifteen percent or so um uh range, you know, alcohol range. Um and you know, again, I, I thought I'd walk through um just a, a couple of recipes or styles that I've done with some timelines and uh and and give gives the our listeners out there something to think about but then also um you know I, I had talked to JD and I had talked to the guys about this um these recipes that or you know I'm going to call them recipes I'm not going to call them formulas because they've been done to success once or twice they have not been done to success you know they're they're not something that I've made dozens of times each so if if we've got our listeners out there and our our loyal brigade of of mead makers if they want to play with these and tweak these and find a better way of doing it um i think it'd be a great you know open sourced project um for some feedback for you guys to all of our listeners to tell us uh you know, what their experience was, what they, what they did differently or, or how they were able to improve it. 
and uh, and bring these along. Yeah. Um, now, I'll tell you guys that my my personal style is I like uh, I like relatively dry meads, um, and relatively might be uh, might be an understatement. Um, I wouldn't mind if there were sand in the glass. That's how dry I like mine. Um, and, and I don't, I don't have anything to send you. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, well, it's not the only thing I like. It's, it's just, it's something I like. And I also don't mind tart. Um, you know, not, not that candy sweet tart tartness, but, but you know, a a sour cherry. I don't have anything to send you. Well, I'm always open. I'm always open for trying. Uh, I love trying things, and and it's not to say that that's those again. These are the only things I like. Now, look, hold your when you get my package, hold your nose, choke it down, and you'll get drunk, and you won't care. There we go. There we go. Um, you know, and that's another. It's it's interesting. I know a lot of people will say that different kinds of alcohol give them a different kind of buzz. You know, and and maybe a lot of that's you know. BS or baloney, but you know, I, I think it's, and maybe it's just that it creeps up on you in different ways. But, um, I, you know, I, you know, Chris, is, he's joked a lot about people who have, uh, you know, gotten drunk on his stuff and that kind of a thing. And I've, I've had mead creep up on me by surprise as well. Um, and I know that every one of uh, any every one of the gentlemen on this radio show and and every one of our listeners is always in ultimate control. But that uh, that session style mead gives you a little bit of a longer fuse too, in case that happens. <laughs> but uh, so let me ask you a question before you get to the recipes. Yeah. Uh, when how do you like to do yours as far as uh, still or carbonated because. When I think session mead, I automatically think carbonated. So what's your take on that? And and anybody else that wants to chime in? Two two of the uh two of the three that I'm gonna talk about tonight are carbonated and, and absolutely so. Um the and the third one um I think could be carbonated as well. Um and I think they'd be good. Now I, I don't think that every single one has to be carbonated. Um, and I think that you can have different levels of carbonation, but, um, I, I do also like, um, you know, some carbonation, uh, along with them. Again, that not a necessity. I, they, they work well still, but you know, who doesn't like a bubble? What do yeah. you think it adds to it? I mean, as far as I know, if you've made these before, you've you've tasted them both ways. What do you think the carbonation adds? I think it gives it a little more vibrance, a little more brightness, um, you know, and, and especially in the summer, I think it it gives you a little more refreshment. Um, that's what I I think. You know, a lot of it, and, and some of this could be uh, psychoschematic and uh, and and a little bit of conditioning, but but sometimes you just you think you know a nice refreshing drink sometimes has uh, has bubbles. Now you know, of course, iced tea and lemonade don't necessarily have you know bubbles in them, but you know, I guess a lot of the time when you when you think of think of something cold and refreshing. Um, you know, you've got that carbonation with it. That's true. I mean, I love a yeah. nice lemonade or a nice, you know, uh, I, I, I don't like them particularly real sweet, but, uh, I mean, I like a nice sun tea in the summertime. Well, you know, I've got, I've only got one session mead recipe that I've made more than a few times. And, uh, it's that multi berry that Jeff spilled on his floor. And, uh, it's, it's carbonated, but I've always felt that the carbonation sort of smoothed it out. Uh, I don't know that it really adds anything, but I think it actually 
maybe covers up some flaws a little bit and kind of smooth smooths the rough edges uh, and you can drink that thing in you know three weeks from the day you pitch the yeast uh, and it's gone i mean it's good stuff at three weeks uh, and I, i've always thought that it was the carbonation that did that um, it just sort of smooths the rough edges over yeah, that that's another great point. I think that uh in the same way that that sometimes a little bit of sweetness can can smooth the rough edges over uh, in a mead or or even a wine or how an extra dose of hops can smooth the rough edges over in beer. Um, you know, carbonation can do the same thing. Yeah, I've learned to have a, a little more appreciation for carbonated drinks because typically and people have heard me say this before i i don't care for anything carbonated but my beer uh and i guess that comes from my dislike of soda pops and uh things of that nature i mean it's just i i just i don't drink them i, I never have liked them uh and uh but lately i mean i, I may i guess the first uh the first time i ever had a, a slightly carbonated mead uh must have come from i think it was golden west chris uh back on the other show and then of course the growing fell stuff uh and i i really liked that they were uh and i kind of lean more towards ryan's liking uh this session mead stuff is kind of right up my alley i think uh, when it comes to this mead making i like it on the drier side and I don't mind the uh, the carbonation. I think it really adds that brightness, that vibrance that Ryan's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'll get into a couple of these. Now I'll tell you guys, you know, <laughs> the, these are very simple. I, they're they're very simple to well, make. But, uh, before before you before you get into that, let me let me ask you another question. Sure. When, when it when it comes to making this session mead, can it be treated like, uh, you know, we've got all these styles, melomels, braggots, I mean, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, when it comes to adding fruit, fruit juice, uh, all these additions that people commonly throw in, uh, is it possible to make a nice light? session mead using those same principles absolutely okay. yeah i i would say apps i would say the only thing you're really changing and i'll get into this the only things that you're changing from a lot of the recipes that we've talked about or that i've made is you're uh, you're using less honey um and then it's going to ferment faster and so because there's not as much sugar for the yeast uh you know to munch on and so um you you're going to have a, a faster fermentation time um and i'll and i'll get into that um okay. you know uh as i talk through these uh with the um the uh kind of protocol that i followed but no you're not you're not changing you know anything anything at all in in your protocol or your methodology or uh or anything else that you're doing right Okay, so what's the uh, what's the first recipe? So th this is um, again. I was going to tell you guys. You know, I, I I wish that I could say some things that were really profound and and really had a uh, had a wow moment on them. But but I these are these are very simple recipes. They're they're very uh, simple ingredients, and um, you know I think you're gonna basically. Um, uh, you know, think, geez, that's it. That's all we had to do, or that's all there is to it. <laughs> um, so with that, you know, I'll start. I'll start out with um a uh, a lemon. This is a, a lemon mellow mel, and it is a um. It's it's a great summertime drink uh it's it's nice and light um this one i turned into a um a two gallon batch so the recipe i'm going to give you guys is for um 
two gallons, and I guess I, I could in my mind here kind of break it down to one gallon. So, um, you know, if we're doing, just so I don't get confused, I'm going to, I'm going to list it off as, as two gallons and then, uh, sure. you know, we can, you, you guys are all, all smart, you know, and, and all our listeners are smarter than we are. So they'll, they'll get through it. Sure. Um, it started off with, uh, two and a half pounds of, uh, Two and a half pounds of wildflower honey. Now, again, this is I, I've I've made it uh, with wildflower honey, and I've made it again with white clover honey. Um, I I really didn't have a preference one way or the other. So I in this recipe out of the the test wildflower and white clover, one didn't have a clear winner. Um, two and a half, so two and a half pounds of honey. Um, there are in the refrigerator section of the, of the supermarket, uh, there are these minute made, um, seven and a half ounce bottles of hundred percent pure lemon juice. Uh, all they contain is, is, uh, says pure filtered water and concentrated lemon juice. And that's, and that's it. Um, so I, I added three of those. So that gives you uh, 22 and a half ounces of lemon juice. And, uh, you know, and that's, and you, then water is all you're using. You're, so you're 22 and a half ounces of lemon juice, which is three, seven and a half ounce plastic bottles of Minute Maid, uh, 100% pure lemon juice, two and a half pounds honey, fill it up with water. Um, you are, um, I've done this twice. Uh, once I did it with, with, um, 1116 yeast, the, uh, the Lalvin 1116. And I had done it a second time with, um, Y yeast 1388, the, uh, the Belgian. So if you're keeping score at home, I had used the wildflower honey with the 1116 I had used the white clover with the uh 1388 so yes there were two variables in there it, it, it would be probably difficult to say um you know which which was which but you know what was contributing but again there was no clear winner so mm-hmm. now that I've got everybody thoroughly confused and we go back to our uh, 2 gallon 2 gallons batch 2 and a half pounds of honey 22 and a half ounces of lemon juice, the rest of the way we're using water. Um, you know, we pitch your yeast. Um, I use uh, a modified, uh, uh, kind of a modified staggered nutrient or organic staggered nutrient protocol. I only use Fermade O. Um, I do my first addition at pitch. Um, 24 hours later, uh, aerate and do your second addition. And then at the 48 hour mark, aerate and do your third addition. And that's it of, of your, uh, Fermato. And it's the standard, um, I don't have how that. Many, how I don't many have grams? That. Yeah. I don't have that in front of me. What is it's, it's the standard. Um, I have to pull that up. Let me pull that one up here. I knew you were going to ask that question. I knew I was going to have it in front of me. Um, the um, boy, the lemon. Does this come out something? You know, uh, my wife enjoys. Uh, there's an Italian liquor out there called limoncello, and oh, yeah. if you get the if you get the really expensive <laughs> imported stuff, that's the best kind. Uh, any brand at that point, uh, you want to stay away from the from the cheap stuff, but. Uh, does it come out anything like that at all, or is it? Does it I don't. Uh, to me, it comes out like a like a hard lemonade, and and I don't mean alcoholic hard, but I mean you just you know it's it's not as sweet. It's a little just a little more tart, um, yeah. and it's it's good. It is um, uh, you know roughly what are we looking at here? I I'm gonna have to go back here. Um, 
I know. Um, couple, yeah. If, go ahead. You're going to be sitting around 1070, probably starting gravity. Two and a half yeah. pounds in a. No, wait a minute. That's two and a half pounds in two gallons. So. You're going to be know. coming you're over than be, that. Just you're jump be on uh, jump on Mead Maker's site. <laughs> Uh, jump on Mead Maker site and run the 30, uh, the deal. Little thirty five points per pound. That's seventy uh, ninety five. Uh, you're looking at uh, somewhere around forty to forty ten forty to ten forty five starting gravity. Yeah, you. Um, yeah, you can. You might be getting a little bit higher, depending on depending on your honey, and that that lemon juice does add a little bit. Um, I've got uh, ten ten fifty was where I ended on uh, with with one of the batches here that had where better you, notes. Where you, where you ended or where you started? Where I started. Yeah, okay. Where I started. Uh, so then what you're going to do is you also need to keep, I, I told you about these, the three additions and I'm, um, as I'm, as I'm looking for the, uh, the, the, the notes here on the, um, uh, for Mado. um, with that being said, let's see here, 10, 50. Two gallons. So you're looking at roughly um, about it's about a uh, you're doing about a, roughly a gram a, between a gram and a gram and a half per edition. You know, of the fermato. Okay. So that's and, and yeah, I apologize that took me a minute there. Um, you're gonna let that go as dry as you can with that that's gonna that should go all that should go pretty dry on you it, it the uh the 1388 does have a tendency to stall out a little bit at about um 10 30 and it needs usually a little agitation uh gets you know gets that over its little hump but that that yeast does have um for whatever reason a tendency to stall out right about there um, you're going to let that go dry. And then this one I found was best carbonated. So I, I've carbonated it a couple of different ways. I've done it, uh, in a keg, uh, you know, regular, you know, your, your forced carbonation. Um, uh, it's also fine to bottle condition. Now, when I bottle conditioned it, um, I used, um, corn sugar. Just your regular, um, uh, your regular, you know, brewer's corn sugar that you're gonna essentially make a simple syrup out of on the stove, um, and and add, and you can figure out the level of um, the level of carbonation that you want in that, or, or more importantly, what your bottles can handle. Um, you know, if you're doing a standard beer bottle, I think they can hold maybe about a three carbonation, which is really as high as you'd need. I'm just saying to be careful of the sugar. Um, and you know, in one of those, maybe it's, uh, maybe one ounce per gallon. So maybe two ounces of that priming sugar for two gallons would be enough or, or one ounce for one gallon. You know, you make your syrup out of that, um, you know, put that it's probably not using a bottling bucket, you know, if you're doing a one gallon batch. Um, but if you gently, gently, uh, incorporate that into the, into your gallon and then, and then bottle off, if you're going to do that, um, there, the yeast is, if this hasn't been sitting for months and months and months, um, there should be enough yeast in that to, uh, to bottle condition it, uh, to chew up that, that little bit of sugar and give you some nice, um, uh, give you some nice carbonation. Okay. Um, that one I had the, uh, the least notes on, but I just remember how tasty it was. I wanted to jump over 
to a uh, a sizer that I made that was also very. This was this was one of the uh, one of my favorites, and it was a favorite amongst people that I um, uh, that I shared it with. This is a one gallon batch for a hibiscus uh, sizer. And what you're going to start with, it's a one gallon batch. It's one gallon of, uh, apple juice. Uh, the, the brand I had was, was Kirkland's, you know, out of Costco. Uh, one pound of wildflower honey. That got a starting gravity of 1065. Now, again, I told her at the start of this, this isn't necessarily how I'd want to repeat it, but it's, it's how I did it. I used, um, uh, 1118, yeah, the EC, Lalvin EC 1118. Um, you know, I, I, I only had to do, I think I, with this one, my notes stop after one edition of the firm eight O. I mean, I, whether I didn't uh, do more or it dried up, you know, before the very quickly, it it uh, just happened that way. But it was it went down to um, it. Its final gravity was point nine eight. Yeah. Started okay. started at ten sixty five, went down to point nine eight. Um, now here, what I did is what I what I uh, didn't tell you guys was in secondary. So I did prime. It was uh, I one gallon batch. Uh, I racked it over into a um, slightly larger vessel uh, that had, and I put roughly uh, eight eight ounces of a very very strong hibiscus tea that I had made. I had gone to the local tea shop and I brought, bought uh hibiscus tea, which is basically just dried hibiscus leaves. I made a very strong hibiscus tea. I don't have all the details on that. So strong is going to be a relative term because I just put a lot of, I filled up a, uh, a um, tea, a loose leaf tea ball. Tea, tea ball. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, put that in a, you know, boiling water, essentially, a, you know, a mug of boiling water and let it steep. And that I did let it steep for about a half an hour um, and then added that. So now uh, and there was, you know, some more action in in secondary um, that one as well. I bottle conditioned. So the final gravity, you know, before the bottle conditioning was was nine point nine eight. Um, added, um, the, uh, uh, you know, one, one ounce per gallon of your, your priming sugar, uh, which I had boiled off, boiled with, uh, you know, a few ounces of water and added and then, and then bottle condition there. Um, that one was very, very tasty. Uh, that one got better with age. I, it was good to drink immediately. It was great to drink immediately, but it, it also, um, aged very well, uh, with, um, for how long I, you know, the last bottle that I had of it was about a year old Mm -hmm. and some of the tartness, the, the hibiscus tea that I made was very, very tart. And when you've got it that dry, that tartness really sticks around. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't really mind it again, it's carbonated and it's ice cold and it's, it's good. Um, but as time went on that one, um, that tartness kind of faded a little bit, it kind of rounded off and it, uh, it went well. Now, you know, I'm calling that one a, uh, a session mead or or uh at least that's in our conversation here for a session mead but you know the calculations i just gave you um you know of starting at 1065 and ending at at uh 0.98 i mean you're you're what 10 11 percent somewhere in there 
Somewhere, yeah. Oh, so, still, yeah. Call it a high session need. A high session, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a high session need. Yeah. Um, Instead of know, sitting at the bar, you're standing at the bar. Yeah. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And All this. Right. This last one I'm going to give you is one we talked about just a couple of weeks ago, which was the um, the cherry bourbon, mm, which yes. was uh, very good here. And and again, this was a uh, one pound. So this one was one pound of honey uh, per gallon. Um you know, and, uh, it, and then I, after it had com- completely gone dry, I added four ounces of, t- I stabilized, sorry, I should mention that. So it completely dry, stabilized it, four ounces of cherry juice and one bourbon stave. Uh, and it sat in there for, oh, looks like about th- about three and a half months that that bourbon stave sat in there and it was it was absolutely delicious i think that if you were to carbonate it i think it would be i i think that you would want this one was this one was great still i'm not going to carbonate this one because i think you'd lose some of the delicateness of the flavors that mm-hmm. bourbon mm-hmm. first of all the bourbon and the cherry are very light in this and and i think carbonation or even even too much cooling would um would kind of mute those flavors so i'm going to drink it this this is a room temperature one you know that that's good room temperature and is mm-hmm. and is good still um i think you could carbonate it if you wanted it if you wanted to you know i'd probably recommend force carving this one um and uh what if you bumped up the cherry juice uh go to like maybe six ounces seven ounces of cherry juice and uh uh, added some more uh, wood to it. So that's what I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say that if you wanted to, if you, you could, if you wanted to carbonate it or drink it cool, you you might want to up your cherry juice or up your your bourbon. You know, you might want to add more bourbon cubes, or you maybe a you know a tablespoon of bourbon or so right into it. Um, but to me, the one thing I just can't visualize is is a carbonated bourbon. Yeah, and, no, me no. and and so that's another reason I'm going to leave this one still. Um, I'll tell you that one that I did that uh, didn't work out quite as well as I wanted it to was again I took that that base mead, which was a uh, one pound per gallon, let it go totally dry. Um, on that one, I'm sorry, I, sh- I should have also mentioned that that cherry bourbon, that yeast was um, a uh, you probably get by with a 71B or yeah, I don't, again, I don't. Y- the yeast didn't, it was a fairly, it was a neutral yeast. It didn't, didn't, uh, I mean, it wasn't putting off a lot of flavor. So I don't think that a lot of it was, was necessary. I don't, I think anyone, yeah, your, your 71B or, you know, D47. KB1, D47. I think, yeah, any of those is going to be fine. I mean, again, it, these, these aren't exactly formulas that are recipes. Um, the last one I'll tell you that, that, uh, I think you could carbonate, but you'll need to up. It was so the, the base, fi- the base mead, one one pound per gallon. Let it go totally dry. Stabilize it. Um, I tried something here where I, I wanted a little bit of blueberry, but I wanted um, I wanted it to be kind of gentle, and I wanted it to be uh, I guess muted's not the right term, but delicate, so to speak. So I put uh, one pound of frozen blueberry sorry not one pound one cup one one cup Cup. of frozen wild blueberries into this one gallon of uh, of mead um and uh it sat for about about three and a half months and it came out it was too muted it was too delicate it was too light 
Mm-hmm. So I, I think that if you wanted to do, if you, I'd, I'd, I'd try, I'd double it. I'd either, uh, do two cups of, of blueberries and rest it on there or long, or a longer period of time. You know, you could maybe leave it on there. What for, if you, uh, yeah. you know, if you have a Trader Joe's, uh, which is quite popular pretty much all across the country, uh, what if you, and they they always carry a pretty good uh, selection of organic, raw, nothing added, you know, no preservative uh, juice. So what if you substituted the one cup uh, of frozen wild blueberry for uh, like four ounces or six ounces of blueberry juice? Would you accomplish yeah. the same? That's yep, and that's where I was. That's what I would say based on what I the the great um, results that I got with that cherry, adding the four ounces of cherry juice to that bourbon, that cherry bourbon. Uh, I would I would uh, do the same. I would say that you could um, uh, add your four ounces of blueberry juice. And really, where I was trying to go with this is, I would say I don't know if if trying to rest it on the fruit, I called it, that's what I called it. I called it resting the meat on this, on this fruit. I really don't know if, if, if on a low alcohol, you know, low alcohol mead, um, it's going to do much for you. Maybe if it was a lot, you know, it's not, it's not your 40, you know, percent 80 proof vodka that's going to pull off, um, you know, a lot of these infusions, you know, if you want to make, you know, your, your different flavored vodkas. I mean, it's, it's fairly light. Um, and so the juice is, is what you've got now, you know, we've talked, you talked about Trader Joe's. I know there's the, there's the Nudsen's juices, um, mm-hmm. and they make some good stuff. They've got a pomegranate juice. They've, I think they even have a blueberry juice. Um, where I was trying to go with this overall is a nice way to make a nice light, uh, refreshing, um, you know, session meat or hydromel or whatever you want to call it, I think is, is if you've got, if you're starting at around the, uh, the one pound of honey per gallon, um, somewhere between that four to six ounces of juice is probably going to give you the, the right amount of flavor. Now it's probably dependent of course on the juice you're adding, you know, black currant is going to probably be a lot stronger than, you know, your something else, but, um, you know, strawberry juice or something, but, um, it would be about the right place to start if you, um, wanted to, um, if you wanted to, to make your, your fruit or add, add some fruit essence to it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say wine cooler or something like that, but, but to get that, that lower alcohol fruit, fruit one in. Now at the same time, what I will tell you is I've done, I'm, I'm still working on perfecting, um, this, uh, ginger ale or, you know, style session, but at, uh, at 5%, the ginger does infuse very nicely. I didn't, I know I didn't talk about that and I'm not, uh, mm-hmm. ready to talk about it in, in a recipe format yet here, but, but I can tell you that at, uh, adding raw ginger in, in chunks, essentially, you know, you buy your, your knuckle of ginger and you, you know, you cut it up and you, you know, into, into chunks, um, at, at that, that one pound per gallon, which, you know, is, depending on the honey you have and everything else is going to get you right around 5% or, you know, give or take. Um, but that will pull that ginger flavor really nicely for you. Um, but for some reason, you know, that fruit just doesn't pull quite as well. Um, well, I know I, I totally, uh, you know, kind of, fumbled through and and negotiated that one pretty jet segment pretty (laughs) gingerly because i'm going through three different notebooks and several loose leaf sheets of paper and even a spreadsheet or two as i'm trying to find this information um but um no overall overall um i i'd say that that's whether you call them sessions whether you call them hydromels whatever you want to call them 
Um, is it, is it really nice category, you know, mead category, uh, that I enjoy making, that I enjoy drinking? Um, more often than not, they're carbonated. They don't have to be carbonated. Uh, you know, they're going to ferment fast for you. Um, and it's, it's the same type of thing. I mean, if you, if you like, uh, you know, we'll use, use Chris, you know, Chris has got that, that heart of darkness that he likes, you know, that, or that he's working on or the, uh, heart murmur, I should say the, the heart yeah. murmur, the heart of darkness, uh, tribute mead, we'll call it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean the, the hydromel session mead style of that is probably, you know, five is one pound of honey per gallon, uh, you know, and then one ounce of your raspberry juice, one ounce of your black currant juice, you know, one ounce of your, uh, tart cherry juice, and then, uh, you know, back sweetening it with, you know, stabilize, well, it's stabilizing it, adding the juice, and then, and then, uh, back sweetening it with maybe another, you know, ounce of honey or something. But, um, you know, I guess. As opposed what I'm, to seven and a half pounds of fruit per gallon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I guess yeah. it's it's a way that they're they're a little lighter, they're a little easier drinking, they're a little easier to make. Now, again, if anybody if anybody hung with me through my uh, you know trotting, you know plodding up and down the track here, trying to get you those out, we we are going to put these uh, these rough note recipes on on themeathouse.com. And I do encourage every anybody out there who's interested in it or wants to do it to uh, to try them out, to make them, and then also to give us their notes back and say what they liked, what they didn't like, what how they could improve it, and uh, and what they um, what they thought, um, you know how to how to make it a little a little better. I should also mention I didn't I didn't say it earlier, and this is the last thing I'll say before we move on is that in that lemon mellow mill. Um, on one of the batches, after it was done, I did add a uh, a few ounces of black tea, um, just because I thought it was a little it was a little too tart. This the one of the batches, and uh, and I wanted a little um, a little of that black tea in there to help balance it out, which which worked great, by the way. Um, but uh, but again, all this will be on on the meathouse dot com and and uh, the next time I I speak, I promise not to fumble quite so much. <laughs> you did a good job. I uh, you know what I get out of this, Ryan, is uh, you know these low alcohol five percent meads is something that you know if you bottled them in beer bottles 12 ounces i mean you could take a four pack uh, or a six pack to the barbecue and you know sit around with your friends and polish it off and uh really not have to stumble uh, stumble around so uh, you know unlike you know drinking some of this high alcohol you know 12 13 14% stuff that you know people commonly make uh i think so yeah, that's exactly what I do. If you if you if you would substitute twelve ounce bottle for twenty two ounce bottle, just so you don't have to bottle quite as many of them. Yeah. Um, that's what I do. I, I use those twenty two ounce bottles. I put them in the twenty two ounce bottles, and then I I usually will bring a couple to a, a barbecue or a gathering or whatever. And and it's fun. It's people like to sample them. They like to try them. They they do that. And um. They're extremely approachable. I have I have yet to um, to have somebody taste it and really give you one of those uh, you know one of those looks like you've got um, yeah. you know like they just really didn't enjoy what they put in their mouth. <laughs> what the hell uh, did you just poison me with? <laughs> yeah, you know it's it's it, it's very approachable because it's it's like something they've had before. Whether it's you know whether it's a a cocktail or a malted beverage or whatever it's sure. it's easy it's approachable they like doing it and and frankly that's kind of you know like say oh well this is actually fermented from honey you know and you start talking about it that way yeah well that kind of leads us into the next segment uh you know when when we're sitting here talking about all these recipes coming up with ideas you know what's the next step uh, you really want to find out how good your stuff is 
Let's throw it over to Jeff across the table over here. Jeff is our resident uh, judge. He's also, what is it now, Mississippi, the third world's best? What the hell is it? He's the one-third best. The one-third world's best mead maker. So, uh, uh, Jeff, talk to us about uh, competing. We know the Major Cup coming around here just shortly. I believe it's in, in March. Um, what does what is entering your mead into a competition? How, how does that help a, a home mead maker who's not well, really into? You know, we're not looking at this from the perspective of you know my next step is starting a meadery. My next step is wanting to really know if I'm really doing a good job or not. And that's exactly the point. I mean, the the reason that I started getting into competitions is really that. Uh, the people that were trying my meats were my family and friends. And I think my, my family, God bless them, would never say that, oh, this, this wasn't very good. They just wouldn't ask for more. Right, uh, right. My friends, my Gosh, friends being my friends my would family, say, my oh. family, my family's your family. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, funny how that, there's so many similarities. And <laughs> like I was about to say, my friends, um, you know, they, uh, they really wouldn't complain as long as there's free alcohol involved. It's, they would tell me hand over fist, it's very good. It's very good. Even if it was the worst meat they've ever had, it's very good. Um, so my my frustration came about because I yeah, I felt like I needed some objective opinions on it. And really, if you look at the entry fees on on most of these meat competitions or even beer competitions, they're very approachable. You're, you're paying usually in the neighborhood of Six seven dollars. Uh, I forget exactly what the the, the Mazer Cups fee is. It, it might be a little bit higher, but it it's still very affordable. You're going to spend more shipping your alcohol uh, to the the competition than you will actually entering the competition. And I'll get into shipping and things like that a little later in the talk. Um, but the idea is that the the people that judging that are judging this competition, they have some degree of expertise in the field, whether it's just a a basic uh, BJCP certification like I have. Uh, a, a number of people that have judged my work I know have been you know, working professionals. I had uh, one of the first uh, competitions win, competition wins I got. The head judge at the table was a sommelier from Argentina. Um, and there are, there are professional winemakers judging this. There are professional you know, mead makers in a lot of cases judging um, different rounds. So you, you get a, an opportunity for people that you know something about the craft to to try your stuff, tell you what you're doing right, tell you where you can improve, and all in all, it's a, it's a great opportunity to um, to to get to pick people's mind and um, get, get some feedback on your your wine that um, sorry your your meads um, that is uh, it, it's not influenced by you know, people knowing you. It's it's very subjective. Um, so, like I said, the, this is all managed by the BJCP. All the, the American key competitions are based on uh, this organization, which is the Beer Judge Certification Program. And they have a specific program for me, uh, like the one I've been through. Um, their, their guidelines are the ones that we use for entering the competition, for judging the competition, and things like that. And essentially, the the competition at this point has 13 categories for mead. Uh, three of those are your basic traditional. So you have a dry traditional, you have a semi-sweet traditional, and you have a sweet traditional. Um, there are about five different mellow mills. Um, there's spices, there's vegetables, and uh, fruit and spice. Um, then there's uh, a, an open category or two that do historical styles or experimental styles. And so there's a lot of different places where you can fit in there. Um, when you're entering a meeting competition, they're going to ask you a number of things. They're, first of all, they're going to ask to define um, which, which style it fits in. And the, you can find their guidelines for these styles easily available online. Just search for BJCP meet guidelines and it'll bring up the, uh, the PDF of that. Uh, Generally, it's it's pretty cut and dry. So if you've got a sizer, it's probably going to go in sizers. Uh, if you've got a sizer that's been spiced with um, spices, that might go in the fruit and spice category. Um, if if you're 
a little bit unconcerned, or if you're a little bit uncertain as to which category it goes into, um, you know, we're, we've got six or seven different mead groups on Facebook right now. Uh, I know Reddit has a very active homebrew community. Got Mead has the forums. There are a lot of places you can go and people that have been part of these competitions in the past will be able to, to help give you some guidance there. Um, that help kind of narrow down which category you go into. Once you get into that category, they're going to ask you some further information. Uh, one of the things they'll ask is the, um, the strength of the meat, essentially. And they have different categories, hydromel, standard, and sack. Hydromel is basically anything, I believe it's under 7.5%. Uh, so the, the session meats, for the most part, that we talked about with Ryan just a few minutes ago, all fall into this category. Um, standard strength, I believe, falls between 7.5 and maybe 12 um, and then the the sack meads are generally the higher alcohol content uh, above 12%, but don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. With that one, it's pretty cut and dry. You can use basic um, formulas to find out, based on your original gravity and your final gravity, what kind of alcohol the yeast converted into, what your alcohol by volume is. Uh, another thing they'll ask is the sweetness level, and they'll ask based on uh, is it dry? Is it semi-sweet? Is it sweet? Now, there's a little bit of a misnomer here in that they give you a, a range of final gravities that um, the sweetness may fall into. I would suggest ignoring that and basing that on your own perceptions because um, I can tell you from my own experience, I have had uh, a Porter Boche bracket that had a very high final gravity but based on just the roasty character of it and the the uh, uh, the hops and things going into it, it felt dry on the mouth. And by the same token, I've had some dry meats that had a lot of floral and a lot of uh, um, herbal character to them that came off as sweet. Um, in in cases like this, the judges don't bring their their hydrometers or their reflectometers to the competition table. They're going based on their perception. If you tell them something is dry and it tastes sweet, or you tell them something is sweet and it tastes dry, you're probably going to get cut off. So I would I would definitely go by the the perception of it rather than the um, the, the the guideline for final gravity. The, the last question they'll ask you is uh, carbonation level. Is it is it still is it petalant or is it carbonated and uh, generally, it's going to fall into one of those three. Petalant is kind of the in-between where uh, if it's bottle carbonated but not very strongly, like the, the session mead that tried to be carbonated that I made uh, but really just ended up with a few bottles, that's a good example of a petalant mead. Um, then within each style, there are some qualities that they, they'll, they'll ask for. Generally, every style, they will give you the opportunity to identify the varietal of mead if you used one. Um, if if you've used a varietal mead or if you list a varietal mead, we will be looking for the character of that mead. Uh, so or the character of that honey. So if uh, if you say, for example, you know, I used a uh, an orange blossom honey, we're going to be looking for the citrus character that is, is characteristic of that. Um, by the same token, depending on the style, you'll also be able to Add uh, or describe the adjuncts for your your meat. So the fruit, the spices, things like that. My advice here is that uh, the best way to approach this is to have, based on your perception, and maybe have uh, a friend or a family member or a couple people try the beads and see what flavors they pick out. Because, uh, for example, the the hibiscus and chamomile dry meat that won third in category last year at the Mazer Cup um, actually had some sumac in it as well. When I entered competition, I didn't list the sumac because I couldn't taste it. And nobody that I I, I, uh, I let try it could taste it either. Uh, if you list an ingredient and we can't perceive it, that that's also going to be counted off because we're, we're not getting the character of that ingredient. So it's better to just leave that ingredient off if it's not if it's not able to be perceived. Um, so Jeff, let me ask you a question. Uh, sure. Taking a step back, uh, you mentioned varietal honeys. Uh, 
more and more I've been using wildflower honey uh, because I've really found some a good source for it. And, and I know that's not a variety, but would you bother listing wildflower? And if so, if that was listed, would that be something the judges would be looking for? Or is it so varied and different from region to region that it wouldn't really make any sense to try and pick it out? Right. The latter is the case. Wildflower is generally understood to be the, the shorthand for mixed varietal or no specific varietal. Um, mm-hmm. So there is so much variety depending on the floral source, time of year, this, that, or the other, that if you just say wildflower, it, it tells us nothing. It, it's not any specific of a, a character that we're looking for. Uh, there, there really is a wide range of wildflower. So, so better just not even to list it. Well, essentially, it's it's the same one way or the other. It's uh, it's understood that wildflower is uh, a non-specific variety, so uh, it would be the same yeah. as non-list. And generally, if you don't list it, I assume it's wildflower. Okay. What um, you know after you you you've entered your your meat into the competition, what? What, what can you look forward to? What, what's the benefit back to a home mead maker? What, what am I expecting back from this competition? Sure. Even if I don't win, I'm, I'm not, you know, some of us out here, are, we're not looking for medals and awards, uh, but we are looking for feedback. Right. And, you know, medals, they're nice. Um, I, I have a few, and I, I will lie and say that I'm not proud of them. I am. Uh, but feedback is really the, the the meat of why I enter into competitions. I, I kind of want to see how my stuff fares out there in an objective marketplace. What you'll get back is a a single sheet form, uh, judging form, uh, for each round of competition your mead was in. Uh, so if your mead does well and advances to the second round, then you'll get two feedback forms for each uh, entry. Uh, if it doesn't do so well and it stays only in the first round, you'll get one feedback form. Uh, you can also find this form online. Just search for BJCP Mead uh, Judging Form, and uh, you, you'll pull up the generic one there. It gives you the different categories, and generally they will um, the the mead judge is supposed to comment on. Um, each category, there are five. There's things like appearance, there's flavor, there's aroma, uh, clarity, um, and then kind of a, an overall um, a, a, a taste. Sorry. Uh, appearance and clarity go together. The taste is one, and then there's kind of a catch-all overall uh, category as well. That um, the uh, sorry the uh, it it kind of gives the, the the judge an opportunity to list like final um, perceptions or final thoughts, kind of an overall feeling uh, that sums up their their experience with the mead. Uh, yeah. So, it in a way it kind of gives them an ample opportunity to break down the different ways that they perceive the mead, the different ways that uh, um, they find things that they liked or didn't like about it. Okay. I wonder, um, is there a place, uh, you know, I'm trying to think back when we, when they, we did the old show. Uh, I remember we, at the end of the show, we used to talk about the different competitions and, uh, is there any single place? I don't know that, you know, it's not like beer cup. I mean, there's a couple of websites that uh, I don't have off the top of my head, but I know there's a couple of them out there that you can go to the list m- multiple just competitions all over the United States, uh, right. mostly for, for beer. But is, is there a place they can go to find uh, listings of mead competitions? Or I suppose there's a lot of these beer competitions include mead anyway, right? Yes, a lot of a lot of uh, the smaller, like regional homebrew competitions, do include mead categories. Some will expressly say no; it's only beer of certain categories. Some will say um, uh, open to any 
category in BJCP, uh, you, you just kind of have to visit their website. The BJCP itself is, of course, the governing body for a lot of these competitions. So their website has a listing of the competitions nationwide that they're, uh, um, they're, they're participating in or they're, uh, they're governing. The American Homebrew Association also has a pretty extensive list of, uh, of nationwide competitions on their site. Um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that at least one of those two you can filter to need competitions, um, in their, their search bar. So that may be an avenue. I'm, I'm not 100% certain on that. It's been a while since I've looked at either of those. Um, but I, I am fairly certain that that's an option for at least one of the two. Well, and a good that, start. A good start might even be the the local uh, uh, the local county fair. Uh, absolutely. You know, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, county and state fairs do have wine competitions as well, and a lot of those are um, have a, a place for honey wine. <clears throat> I know. Not all of them are um, are BJCP sanctioned, though, so it, it may not necessarily be the same judging criteria as you would find at the Mazer Cup or a lot of these other competitions that we're talking about. Yeah, but you know, you it, you could. Is still there a reason- list of? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say you could still reasonably get some objective feedback from entering into those too. Is there a list of judges who will accept payoffs or favors that I can get in touch with? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I really need that list if I could get it. <laughs> oh, God, only from Mississippi. Uh, good stuff, Jeff. Um you know, I, I and that's that's you know as as I get better and better because I finally found my little niche in in the mead, uh, this braggart thing that I'm really working hard at. So I mean, my next step is, I think, going to be trying to enter one of my uh, one or two of my uh, my concoctions into one of these uh, competitions. I'm just, I'm looking to see, uh, and I don't care about the metal part. I just want to see where I'm at with. It. You know, I want to get somebody else's. I want to get a professional's uh, feedback on 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 my uh, uh, on my uh, you know recipe. So, sure. um, well, JD, I know you've never entered a competition. I know Jeff no. has. What about uh, Aaron and and Ryan? Have either of you uh, entered before, or do you plan to? I never have personally. I think it's definitely something I would be interested in doing because I, I agree with you know with the comments that Jeff has made it's a great way to get some objective feedback yeah mm-hmm. and for me it, it wouldn't necessarily be about you know winning the medals although I, I think like Jeff said too I I would certainly be proud if, if I did win one but I think ultimately the motivator for me to do that is just to to try to get better you know and, and improve the craft yeah, I've got a few on the calendar. I haven't entered any. I, I there was a couple last fall that I had that I had circled on the calendar, but I just didn't have anything that I was excited about entering. Um, so I didn't. I've got a few on the calendar for this year that I'd like to enter um, for the same reason to get feedback. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I really enjoy about the mead categories as opposed to the beer categories is the beers that I make don't fit nicely into the beer categories as described by the, uh, uh, you know, BCJ, uh, you know, the beer judges, um, BJCP. Um, and, even though they're nice to drink and they're, you know, people enjoy them and that kind of a thing, um, they don't fit quite nicely into those categories and, and they wouldn't be good representations of any specific style. Whereas with the mead categories, I feel that there is more latitude to produce, um, you know, a wider variety of, of meads and they're, and it's just more about, um, 
is is this a a well done meat or not? And it doesn't have tight as quite of tight categories or compartments that that you need to fit into. Okay. I um I was gonna throw this over to Aaron, uh, and uh, we were gonna talk a little bit about uh, the the brew list for 2017. But Aaron, I think I'm gonna save uh, I'm gonna save your segment for next week, so you're off the hook. Because um, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, working on that, because I think all of us uh, probably have something that we want to add to that discussion as well, but. Um, and uh, we're also kind of uh, late in the hour here, so we need to sort of wrap this up. So if you don't mind, is that okay with you? Yeah, no problem. We can uh, ta- <laughs> table that for next week then. Yeah, and thanks for the 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, we're going to wrap the segment up uh, with uh, Chris and I. We... Uh, as you recall, uh, here several weeks back before the Christmas break, uh, Chris and I started working on this, uh, stuff called graph and, uh, Chris, it's basically just, it, it's apple juice, but, uh, well, I should go the other way. It's actually a beer, uh, that instead of using water as your, base or, or, or your, you know, addition, you use apple juice. And so we both followed a recipe, uh, slightly modified, and I'll give you a brief rundown. It's uh, a half a pound of, now I use the Crystal 120L because I used uh, straight unadulterated apple juice. Um, one ounce of torrefied wheat, uh, uh, four gallons of apple juice, uh, two pounds of DME, one pound of amber, one pound of light DME, a half an ounce of your favorite hops that uh, take you to about 6% AA. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, what was it? We added some uh, black tea. Uh, I think to yep. uh, kind of bump up the mouthfeel a little bit, and yep. you you basically you know l- like a beer, you you boil your wort, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, after you complete your your sixty minute boil, dump it in the fermenter, add your apple juice, and uh, I believe I used the Nottingham uh, yeast, the suggested yeast is either Nottingham or the. Uh, uh, the uh, Saf Ale 05. I used Nottingham, and That's so yeah. So I thought we'd you know we'd catch up on this. Now we're we're several weeks into this. Uh, uh, in fact, several weeks. Probably closer to a month now. I think the the last taste I had. Well, I'm I started a little before you. The last taste I had was uh, before Christmas. So I'm going to pop open one right now. And see where this thing has now, come along. In. Chris bottled his. Mine's in a keg. Um, and uh, I'm. Uh, it's it's already carbonated. Uh, in fact, it's carbonated up to where I wanted it. Something like three. It's 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 almost like a. Oh, lot the head's coming over on this one. Yeah. <laughs> It's really carbonated. Yeah. Uh, It's got uh, four fingers of head on it. Wow. (laughs) That's heavy duty. It's cold, right? Is it cold? Oh, yeah. It's really cold. Let's see here. Well, let's see. What we got on, on the nose, we got... Malt, mostly beer. As far as the aroma, uh, not really mm-hmm. any apple in the aroma. Let's see. Uh, 
Oh, the apple's coming back in the flavor now. Mm. Oh, man, all the tartness is gone. Finally. <laughs> nice. Nice. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, age coming. does wonders for this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, age does wonders for this. This is a... Uh, there's a little bit more... Uh, beer flavor than I would like in a cider, but it's you know the flavor is all apple cider. That's I mean it's it's got uh, it's got a little bit of beer in there, but it's it's definitely a cider. You can tell. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All the tartness is gone. You need to wait on yours for sure. Yeah, I. Um, so. it's- it's been it's been probably ten days since I had uh, some, so I poured a little. I've got these little, I don't know, they're like little quarter cup beer glass, you know, things that you get with a flight in a restaurant, and uh, I had one of those today uh, to prep for the show, and I'm getting uh, there's still a tartness, uh, but it's not it it it's changed. It's it's not that. It's not that metal tartness now. Now it seems to be more like tart apple, uh, the tartness that you would yeah. get out of a Granny Smith apple. Okay, that's uh, completely gone. That's completely gone now. But remember, I'm a, uh, I'm a good four weeks ahead of you. So right, yeah. So yeah, this, okay. This batch so, is, a, is a good four weeks ahead of yours. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm, give, I'm still. Give it month. Yeah, I'm. I'm still working on the tart, but the tartness has changed because remember you and I talked uh, here, uh, oh maybe maybe ten days ago or more, and I was getting this metal tart, uh, and wasn't quite sure what to make of it. But now that's changed. Now it's starting to turn more towards a like almost like a Granny Smith tart apple uh, tartness. Um, mm-hmm. and I did, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what the 120 L, uh, versus the 60 L has done for it. Maybe it's still too young to tell. Uh, but um, from what I understand, well, it had something to do with the tartness as well. Well, uh, apparently so, because, you know, I, I had mixed feelings about this from, from the very beginning, uh, when it came out of primary, it was not pleasant. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> after after about two weeks in the bottle, uh, it was it was pretty doggone good. So then I waited another week, and um, it was awful. <laughs> and so I, I kind of tasted one a week for a while, and it was it was good, and then it was bad, and then it was good. And it just went back and forth. So about a week before Christmas, I tasted one, and it was probably as bad as it had been. It, it actually had gotten worse than it was mm-hmm. previously. And I was I was beginning to wonder, you know, what kind of changes am, am I going to have to make to this? And uh, so rather than making changes, I decided I'm just going to wait. I'm not going to taste it anymore. I'm going to set it aside and do nothing. And uh, so here we are now. Uh, It's been, what, how long has it been since Christmas now? What are we, three or four weeks Uh, since I tasted it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah, so in the last four weeks, it uh, it has definitely come into its own. There's, There's nothing I would change about this. This is as good, I believe... It's as good a cider as I've ever made. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I would do if I made another batch of this. I would do it exactly the same, but with the knowledge that when you make it, don't even bother tasting it. I mean, just set it aside. Yeah, better uh, age. Yeah, I mean, but this thing now is I'm like I said, I'm a, I'm a month ahead of you, so right. Um, there is just absolutely no tartness that shouldn't be there uh, other than what apple cider should have. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because is, like I said, that, really that, tar- good. 
Yeah, that that tar that, that initial tartness that I got left me thinking, oh my god, is this going to be? Uh, am I going to wind up cleaning out the LA drains again with this stuff, or what is this? Uh, wait, just just yeah. wait because it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, give it another month. Uh, this, it's really come along good. This is, like I said, this first taste I've had since now, before Christmas. Uh, and now with that crystal, that, that crystal 120 is known for its caramel, uh, uh, it, do you get any of that at all? Or do you get any, any of the maltiness that comes out of the uh, DME or, or the, or the, uh, the grains at all? Not, not really. I mean, other than just a slight beer like quality. Yeah. Um, and it's very slight. Um, there's, there was a time when I tasted it, that it was very caramelly. There was a lot of, it was almost like a caramel apple. Um, and that has completely gone away. All the tartness is gone. And, uh, I would say the only thing that's lacking a little bit right now may be the, um, the apple flavor and uh, an apple aroma. And, yeah. and I believe that may come back with a, even a little more age. Uh, and the, uh, the other thing that might help would be if I had used a higher quality, um, apple juice, which I did on the second batch, the second batch, I used the simply apple. The first mm-hmm. batch, which I just tasted was not the simply apple. It was just, uh, I don't know. It was some cheap store brand apple juice. So that could have something to do with it as well. But mm, yeah, no, this is good. There's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, the one that the, uh, the batch I put together, I used the Simply Apple as well. That's the uh, pretty much raw apple juice. It's, you know, mm-hmm. nothing added. Yeah, uh, so you're, you're going to have a better outcome with that than this yeah. is. You well, just need and to it, wait a little while. Yeah, and it's starting to. Uh, it, I mean, it's got kind of an amber look to it, uh, almost like a lager, a light amber beer. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, it's, you know, the carbonation uh, it didn't take much. Uh, <laughs> like you, I mean, I had to be careful pouring it in the glass, so I may have gotten a little bit too much in it. But it, I like the carbonation; in it. it tastes good. I like that part of it. It's just got that tartness that I'm still dealing with. So, uh, you know, I'll let, I'm going to let it sit now uh, and uh, give it its four weeks and uh, try it again. And we'll come back on the show and, uh, you know, see where we sit, see if yours got any better uh, with a little more age on it and see where mine's at after uh, the four-week uh, time uh, frame where you're at right now, see what I came up with. So, um, well, if you're so, yeah, a cider we, drinker, this is one to try for sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, we've we've talked about the the kind of ciders that we're looking forward to, you know, stuff like Magners or that uh, Smith uh, uh, cider. The you know some of the imported cider, the real deal is, is what I'm looking for. Uh, but I don't, and I don't mind the beer quality. I think that adds a little bit of. Uh, pizzazz to it uh i guess for lack of a better term but uh guys that kind of brings us up to uh the end of the show here i think we've done enough for this week (laughs) um why uh if you want to catch the replay the meathouse.com or itunes uh it'll be up tomorrow sometime before noon uh, I usually get to it around eight, nine o'clock in the morning. It's one of my Wednesday or uh, uh, Wednesday morning routines. So I look for it then. Uh, beyond that, uh, remember we're on a six and two schedule. I believe this is going to take us up to sometime around February seventh, and then we'll be off for a couple of weeks. So we do six weeks on, two weeks off. Lots to talk about between now and then. We'll catch up with Aaron next week. We'll get him to talk about what's on his brew list for 2017, and I'm sure the rest of us uh, are going to chime in with uh, some things that we'd like to get uh, involved in as well. I'm highly interested in Brian's session needs now. He's got me kind of excited. I've got a number of one-gallon empty jugs sitting here thinking, oh, my God, 
Uh, and I, and I, I probably have 20 to 30 pounds left of wildflower honey. Uh, plus the stuff that I got from my uh, my new the, the beer that I'm working on the the other braggot the cream ale I've got some orange blossom honey so Ryan uh, I may be emailing you getting a little little bit further advice from you about this second mead stuff uh, got a lot going on the mead house uh, check us out themeadhouse.com with that hey we'll catch everybody next week. <laughs>